Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing very well. Today I've got my good friend Ivan with me. Say hello Ivan. Hello. That's, that's beautiful Ivan. Ivan works in the background and puts presentations together for us because that's just the kind of guy he is. Uh, today it's going to be the 18 Warthog Thunderbolt 2 versus the SU-25 Frogfoot. Now you've probably saw some uh, the, the thumbnail when you thought we're going to be dogfighting them and doing cool things like that. That's not really today. Today is documentary. We're going to be looking at statistics, history and stuff like that. Maybe we'll do a bit of flying about later on, but most of you have both of these aircraft in DCS, so you can go and fly them all you want. If there was an award for the most wrongly compared pair of aircraft, it had to go to the pair we are going to talk about in this article. One of the aircraft was designed to be a tank killer, use its advanced weaponry, including a deadly 30mm Gatling gun to rip open tanks, whereas the other was more general purpose, capable of taking out a wide variety of targets with ease. Of course, the 30mm Gatling gun is the Warthog and vice versa. Both of these aircraft would then end up being famous with the armed forces due to the timely support they gave during conflict, thus fulfilling their role of CAS. Both of these would be literally flying tanks capable of surviving a lot of damage and bringing their pilot back. In fact, one of them, the tank killer, was named the Thunderbolt II to honour a World War II era fighter with massive firepower and a lot of armour, also famous for bringing its pilot back after being pretty badly shot up. It was named after the P-4 47 Thunderbolt, which I believe we're getting in DCS. Let's compare these close air support aircraft to understand their differences. So here we've got the A-10, which you all know. Here you've got the Frogfoot, which I'm sure you all know. The version of the SU-25 we're talking about is not the T version, which we get in DCS, but we do have an A version in DCS, which is going to be similar to the this version that we're talking about here. Of course, there are many versions of uh, the SU-25 and a few versions of the A-10. Ideology and selection. In my previous article on Down to Tank Battles of Iraq, I'd stated that American and Western tank industries, even with all their technological might, were no match for the sheer numbers of Soviet units was producing. Even though Western tanks could kill several Soviet tanks before being knocked out themselves, but standing up against nearly 100,000 tanks and other armoured vehicles in service with the Warsaw Pact countries was not going to be an easy task. The T-55 would form the backbone of Soviet tank formations. Its newer variant, the T-62, would supplement it later on. The Western forces led by the Americans needed a tank killer. This tank killer had to kill tanks faster than the Soviets could build them during the conflict. This this aircraft had to stop waves of Soviet armour rolling down European, European planes to protect the Western Allies. It also had to counter growing air defence capabilities being fielded by the Soviets. And we've got the Z Su-23-4, so it's the Shilka, and T covering T-55, so these are the anti-aircraft guided guns. With this in mind, they started the AX program, was a close air support aircraft that was started on March 1967, and RFIs were sent to several defence contractors. Increase in Soviet capabilities meant that the requirements were changed to suit the threat posed by the Soviet armoured formations, following other requirements which were put up to the USAF. Armoured design. 30mm gun with a high rate of fire for killing tanks and armoured personnel carriers, short takeoff capabilities, low cost, payload of 7 tons, which would include 80 GMs, anti tank guided missiles, smart munitions, cluster bombs, etc., a combat radius of 450 kilometres, capable of low level subsonic flight, a large loiter time, and enhanced survivability. And then we have the YA-9, and that is an interesting picture. It sort of got elements of the A-10 there. It's got uh, the engine cells on the side of the uh, fuselages, as we can see. It's got what we pretty much know as the A-10 canopy and sort of a bit of A-10 fuselage. Obviously, it changed very much from there. almost looks like a cross between an A-10 and an SU-20. Uh, SU then we have the YA-10, which is what we've got here, which is pretty much what we're going to know as the uh, A-10, I suppose. Northrop and Fairchild Republic, the later was the designer of the P-47 Thunderbolt, were selected to build their designs and pit them against each other as part of the competition. Northrop built the YA-9, whereas the Fairchild Republic named theirs as the YA-10. These aircraft were pitted against each other in fly-offs, generally how the USAF worked, you know, F-16 versus F-18, um, various, uh, uh, the... Um, F-22 versus the YF-23 and so on. 
Interestingly, the YA-10 didn't fare well during them. USAF selected it even though it didn't satisfy some of the performance parameters as it ended up being more survivable than its competitor with its engines and whatnot. Its engines mounted aft of the wings reduced chances of FOD and damage by ground fire. Larger space between the pylons allowed wider, wider range of weapons to be employed. It was more maintainable. Extensive shielding and separation of critical components made it more survivable. With the YA-10 being very similar to the production variant offered, it emerged as more suitable option. The YA-10 was officially selected in January 1973, God, that's a long time ago, and full-scale production began in 1975. A total of 713 jets were procured over the years, and as per official plans, they were supposed to be replaced by the F-35, and how many years? You know, nearly 50 years later, um, we're pretty much still keeping the A-10s, which just shows you, you can't, like the B-52, you can't beat a good aircraft it's just a great design well basically a hammer is a hammer and it will work in a hundred years that's what those jets are so su-25 frogfoot in the year 1969 the soviet ministry of defense started to look for an aircraft they called Sturmovik, which roughly translates into stormer or attacker soviets felt the need for such an aircraft after studying the performance of the legendary il-2 which we have obviously in the il-2 uh, video game and its successor the il-10 after the production of the latter was stopped in 1950, there were no CAS aircraft under development. The Aleutian Bureau made an attempt in vain with the IL-40 during the early 50s to find its successor for the IL-10. After nearly one and a half decades, the Soviet Defense Ministry put up requirements for such an aircraft. They are as follows. Cheap and reliable construction. Easy to produce and fly. Capable of operating from unprepared airfields. Cockpit should be protected from at least half inch round. Minimal uh, mission preparation. Max payload of three tons. So it's a lot less than the A-10. Combat radius 300 kilometers less than the A-10. Weapons payload should include bombs, unguided rockets and anti-aircraft missiles for self-defense. Operational speed of 800 kilometers an hour at sea level. One of the big differences between the Su-25 and the A-10 is, of course, that the Su-25 was designed for speed. 800 kilometers. I don't have a converter at hand, but I think that's about 500 knots. Uh, an A-10 is topping out at pretty much 300 knots, depending on your payload. This thing is going to go nearly 500 knots. There's a big difference there. Um, and hence, you can see the swept wings and whatnot. That's why it needs less armor, because it's more nimble, basically, and it can escape. Absolutely, absolutely. Interestingly, I'm soon going to be studying the Su-25A. I know that may not be the correct terminology, but the 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 non-T version in DCS, and I'm really looking forward to that because it is, you know, it's nearly Harrier speed. I'm really, it's going to be cool. The point easy to produce was interpreted as an aircraft based on the existing design. Thus, Sukhoi initially offered the Su-15SH, a variant of the Su-15 supersonic Interceptor. McCoy offered MiG-21 SH. Yakolov offered Yak LSH and the Aleutian Bureau offered a variant of the IL-40, designated IL-42. The designation was later changed to IL-102. The designs were submitted within four months of the original request. The interceptor-based ones were rejected as they didn't have the performance, which this new aircraft was supposed to have. Again, anything supersonic is simply not particularly useful in a cast design because loiter time is absolutely necessary, and loiter time and supersonic simply don't go together. The Sukhoi now offered a previously unofficial design instead of the Su-15SH. The design was given the designation TH for internal use in the Bureau. It would have a conventional plano form of shoulder-mounted wings, engines below them, and a regular tail. It offered. It turned out that this T-8 design would be the only one to satisfy the operational requirements. Sukhoi and Mikoyan were given the preference to start work on their designs. However, Mikoyan backed out. Suko was developing its T-8, whereas Aleutian was working on the IL-102, the later ending up being a private venture for the designer. So here we have the Aleutian, the IL-102 prototype, which is an interesting thing. It looks kind of like an Su-25 wing, kind of like Su-25 nacelles. Body, I'm really not sure what it looks like, but terrible visibility. And I see there's a the back aft canopy there. Is that for a rear gunner or something, Ivan? Well, it is. You can see the shape of it and you can be reminded straight away from the IL design you're using 
combat basically the old one the world War 2 yeah absolutely and i didn't spot that to begin with but of course that is just a modernized il that's just a modernized il2 isn't that is a modernized sturm of it jet engine well, it's basically it's the same shape in the same hump in the back but mm -hmm. jet engines uh, God, it's ugly. <laughs> the work was going on smoothly until the Soviets dropped a bomb by increasing requirements to 1,200 kilometers an hour. I'm just going to have to quickly do a um, conversion on that. That's supersonic. That can't be right. Well, at the time, they were aiming for supersonic, oh, but obviously right. it never happened. Right, okay. Well, I've just worked that out, and that is pretty... That is supersonic. It's like Mach 1.1 or something. Okay. Thus, Suko Bureau decided to kill the T-8 and restart work on the SU-15 derivative. However, these specs were soon changed uh, back to 1,000 kilometers an hour at sea level, but increased payloads of four tons. Again, they realized, you know, you can't get a cast type plane with supersonic features. It just doesn't, you can't add it together. The TA design was then revived and modified for the change requirements. The final design process was started in 1972 with the prototypes appearing in 1974, making the first flight for the type on 22nd of February, 1975. There were delays due to the design of the engine, which caused a minor fire and delayed the first flight. The prototypes were tested thoroughly during the late 70s, with one of them being executed, in other words, used for extensive ballistics tests. These tests were followed by Operation ROM, which was started in 1980, when I was born, to test the, both the SU-25 and the Yak-42 in Afghanistan. The, may, the aim was to test both aircraft in real-world scenarios, including live combat operations. The first and third SU-25 pro, SU prototypes were sent to the theater, and they successfully engaged live targets during the conflict. The prototypes logged over 100 sorties, including 45 live combat sorties during the deployment. Their success forced the Soviets to fast-track to fast the development of testing of the SU-25. The state accepted trials were in hand in the later half of 1980 and the aircraft was expected into service thereafter. So we've looked at some history and how they developed. Next, we're going to look at capabilities. First, the A-10 Thunderbolt II. Basically what it happened was they sent it on the live theater where it was basically a war going and they were staying there for five years dropping bombs mm -hmm. before they can actually accept it to the military. Mm -hmm. Hell of a way to prove the aircraft is, is worth it. <laughs> and he just put it straight into combat. That is very SU-25, isn't it? The story of Robert S. Johnson and his P-47 was a testament, testament to the fighter's ruggedness. Of course, P-47, this is what it was all about. Big, heavy, fat, but survivable fighter. Since the Way 10 was supposed to use the Mike 61 Vulcan 20mm Gatling gun, so that was what you find in an Eagle, in a Hornet, in pretty much any of the contemporary kind of fighters. Um, instead of the GAU-8, which was under development at that time, several modifications were made to the production variant to fit the massive 30mm Gatling gun into it. And you can see it, well, as you know, it barely fits into the A-10. Um, it kind of bulges out. The gun itself is slightly to the left and the nose gear is slightly to the right. Behind the pilot, a drum carrying more than 1,300 rounds is placed. The aircraft is literally designed around the gun, which is nearly 6 meters long, so that's what, 18 feet, uh, including the ammo drum. The gun can unleash 4,200 rounds per minute onto its target, giving the pilot 15 seconds worth of firing time. That doesn't sound a lot, but actually 15 seconds is a long time, pretty much more than you'll, you'll ever need. It usually carries armor-piercing rounds, which decimate thin top armor on APCs and tanks to kill them. And that's the, that's the main idea. Tanks are very highly armored, uh, kind of um, at the sides and the front, but certainly in the rear and mainly on the top, you know, they're not designed to be hit. So you can penetrate them. You don't need more than a 30mm armor-piercing cannon to penetrate from the top. A-10 was, uh, also had 11 hardpoints and a 7-ton payload for a wide variety of munitions. The A-10C, which is what we have, well, we have both, A-10A and C, upgrade brings new targeting pod, the Lightning II pod, and several other advanced avionics to improve its tank killing capability. The A-10 pilots have claimed that when the GAU-8 is fired, the vibrations caused by it are similar to those felt by World War II-era pilots firing their guns. Other weapons carried include the new Paveway series of bombs, so we're talking uh, laser-guided bombs, JDAMs, INS, GPS-guided bombs, AGM-65, the Maverick with various seeker heads, um, and the AIM-9 Sidewinder for self-defense. The picture of the A-10 below that has a refueling probe on the front. What's that for? I've never seen one with a refueling probe on the front. 
It might have been a test bed cup. I think it must have been a test bed, mustn't it? But they ended up all having female uh, connections, I believe. Uh, production planes, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so here we've got the A10 against the C-25. You can see the A10's wingspan is much bigger. You can clearly see from there that it's going to be able to carry more weapons. Um, however, this guy is significantly uh, faster. It relies on, as Ivan said, more speed for defense rather than pure you know, metal and design. They actually did a joint exercise a few years back, so that is a real picture from ah. Bulgaria where they were flying together. How interesting. That is very good. That's very good. We've got the ATN firing the GAL-8. Interestingly, it's firing at kind of level here, unless the camera's kind of tilted, but usually you'd be firing in a dive. We've got an AGM-65 Maverick of some sort being fired here. We've got the two in formation here, which looks pretty awesome. Uh, we've got the, you can see the gun offset to, to the side slightly and, and the front wheel offset there. Uh, the defining feature, of course, is the uh, 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 the Gatling gun. The aircraft is powered by two times TF-34 turbofans, producing a total of 18,000 pounds of thrust. And that's not a vast amount, you know, that's less than one engine of a modern-day fighter. But, it's you know, it's not. it was never meant to be a performance plane in that kind of terms. Add moderate wing loading and straight wings to the jet, and you've got a good low-level maneuverability, which you do. And their 14 pilot was shocked to see its maneuvering capability as he was positioning his jet for a simulated kill. Now, interestingly, uh, we do missions where some guys fly these, some guys fly other planes, uh, and we have got humans on the red and humans on the blue. And I've always teach my guy, I'm no, I'm no, you know, fighter expert by any means, but I always teach my guys the basic, which is even if you're in a big fancy F-15 or I don't know F-14 or whatever, never get within five miles of. Uh, one of these because these will literally outmaneuver your fast jet fighter no it doesn't have the, uh, the 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 ability to retain energy but just on a snap turn this will pretty much out turn an f-16 uh, and fire a missile and shoot you down um, so always stay away they they have a deadly sting the a10 eventually turned tides and lined up its gal 8 for a simulated gun kill the aircraft is literally a flying tamp and the pilot literally sits in a titanium bathtub which provides extensive protection for anti-aircraft fire up to 23 mil so the 23 mil is the caliber used by the uh, soviet services zsu 23 gun was just about everywhere uh, at that point and, and presumably still is and so it was designed to protect that. So you've got a titanium bathtub. Presumably it's titanium because it's strong and it's light. And you didn't really want you know, an inch of steel around there. Otherwise, you'd have center of gravity problems. I've always wanted to see one of those bathtubs and I've still not seen a picture of it. One day I will. Uh, the pilot... I'll oh, try and dig one for you. Thank you. The pilot position of the engines makes them... Uh, sorry, the position of the engines makes them a difficult target to hit. The control system has a double hydraulic backup along with a mechanical backup for hydraulic systems. So as we know in our C in game if you lose uh, I just did a if you're watching this then a video is out for how that was a hilarious one yeah absolutely the video will be coming out to show how much damage an A10 could take and we pumped everything into it in terms of failures left hydraulics failed right hydraulics failed we emptied all the hydraulic fluid out of both lines and still all we did was just hit um, mechanical reversion and we could still fly it around unless something came and severed those cables we could still fly it around yes it was very hard to fly but it could fly and we got home. Um, so it's other than blowing a full wing off, in which case it can still almost pretty much fly, uh, it's unkillable. Uh, the fuel tanks are self-sealing and have a polyurethane lining to reduce loss of fuel and damage of the tanks themselves. The primary fuel tanks also have a backup sump for enough fuel to cover over 200 kilometers. The landing gear are exposed so that the aircraft can land with them retracted if needed. I didn't know that. How interesting. The A-10A is surely a very, very, very tough target to kill. And yes, it is. Uh, I sometimes think that they're a little under-modelled in DCS because you can, it is possible to kill them with one sidewinder without killing the pilot. And, well, I don't know. I don't know. What do I know? But uh, well, I don't know. It's just like they go down quite easily. I think that too. I think that too. Um, so we've got a picture of an engine cell here ripped apart. Uh, I don't know if that's by ground attack or an explosion of the engine i mean it doesn't really matter it's an exploded engine and obviously it came back and landed so you know what more do you want again another I've, one I've, yes send i think it was hit by a man pad or something this one roger and we've got one down here which is full of triple a and i mean how they got that much triple a in that area there i don't know but i can't see any other plane in the world surviving that and a big chunk of wing ripped off 
So um, I remember these over Desert Storm 1, Gulf War 1, whatever you want to call it. And they were coming back daily full of ZU, ZSU-23 rounds and stuff. Um, AK fire and man pads. And, um, and they were just coming back with half wings and stuff. Uh, engine re engine to sell peppered by small arms fire here. Awesome. Actually, that doesn't look like small arms. That looks like a missile explosion and shrapnel of some sort. The A-10, more commonly known as the Warthog, and will be replaced by the 5th Gen F-35, <coughs> of course it will, in the near future. The USAF was planning to cull the entire A-10 and transfer of resources and used to keep them operational to other projects. It has also been blamed for the delays in the F-35 program, as the USAF claims that the resources being used to keep them operational could speed up the F-35 program. US Senate blocked the plan to cull the A-10. Yay! Fleet and was redeployed to the Middle East as an as another conflict erupted. It has also been redeployed to Europe theatre, where it was supposed to stop Soviet armoured formations dead in their tracks. They were redeployed to show how support the NATO allies during the rise in tension due to the conflict in the Eastern Europe. Compared to the F-35, A-10 is very cheap, which it is it's just very cheap to operate and easy to maintain. It is combat proven and troops love it. And we've had um, we've had um, you know A10 m mechanics. We've done videos for uh, sorry interviews for, and they, everyone loves it and says the same thing. When they are under fire, the characteristic sound of a gun is the best thing they have ever heard. Several serving members of the U.S. Armed Forces have shown support for the A10, but it is an old aircraft which is nearing the end of its useful life. And that's 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 the thing. In the you can only keep realistically keep an aircraft going for so long from due to metal fatigue. There's only so many modifications you do can do and so on. With the F-35 ready to replace it, it will be interesting to see the approach USAF uses to provide CAS. It will most probably involve deploying JDAMs from high altitudes. It's just not the same though, is it Ivan, um, as walking um, a target on ground troops, walking a GAO-8 onto targets with the ground troop. And not only does it have the pacifying effect of its damage, but also the psychological effect that will do um, uh, to frontline troops. Well, even superficial damage to the F-35 will compromise the stealth and all the rest, and it mm -hmm. needs to be taken care of then after, even if they don't go down. So I mean, I mean and it's amazing. It's lasted for 50 years or something, you know, for, uh, almost unheard of. Um, A-10, B-52, there's very few planes that can do it. Okay, SU-25, Frogfoot we're going to do now. So just like the A-10, the SU-25 was also designed to be a flying tank. The cockpit was covered from all direct, uh, directions and could withstand direct hits from, again, 23mm anti-aircraft fire. The pilot is also protected by an armoured helmet, wasn't aware of that, and an armour plate near the chest, wasn't aware of that. That must be for small arms fire. The engines are widely spaced, thus reducing the probability of both being simultaneously hit and disabled. Engine controls are duplicated and the fuel is fed by different tanks. The tanks are protected by armour, engines and parts of the retracted landing gear. Polyurethane lining reduces loss of fuel and damage due to shrapnel. Flight control systems has duplicated push-pull rods and the elevators have separate control systems. The engine itself can withstand hits from 20 wow, mil rounds and work just fine. They have even reported surviving stinger hits. The aircraft, the engines will run using different fuels like diesel during the trials, and they could also uh, various fuels use various fuels if necessary. That's interesting and important for a, a rugged plane like this. SU-25 is lightly armored compared to the A-10, but this is justified by the different approaches taken by the designers. The SU-25 was supposed to be agile, I'm not sure it's agile, uh, and thus a difficult target to hit instead of being heavy and durable like the A-10. And we've got a guy firing, uh, that's the gun. Um, we've got some rocket pods being fired. Um, another lovely formation shot here. So this is the non-hump version. I've uh, just been reading a few articles in magazines about the SU-25 operating at the moment. There's some really interesting versions out there. Okay, um, that. So we've got some uh, various, wow, look at the size of those bullets. That's pretty awesome. There's the gun, rocket pods, fuel tanks, KGM, MU dispensers, I think. Um, 
and, uh, and so on. In fact, that may be a dispenser as well, I'm not sure. Initially, the prototypes were powered by the R9 300 engines, a non-afterburning variant of the RD9 used on the MiG-19. Didn't know that. The prototypes were re-engined with a non-afterburning variant of the R13 used in the MiG-21. Do know that. The engines were designed, were designated R95 and were replaced by an improved variant R195 during tests. Wings were designed to carry most of the armament with eight hardpoints for anti-surface weaponry and two hardpoints for self-defense weaponry. A single fuselage hardpoint hard point can be used for carrying weapons, sensors, jammers, etc. It can carry advanced air-to-surface weapons like the KH-29 guided uh, air-to-surface, KH-31, and modern air-to-air -air missiles like R-73, which is just a top dog. It's like an AIM-9X uh, Soviet variant or Russian variant. Amazing to have on a, a plane like this. For self-defense. Interestingly, it could also carry tactical nukes. It's a bit late for the nuke game, really, for designed in the 70s, but okay. Uh, SU-25 could maneuver pretty well and pull a maximum of 6.5 Gs and a 30 mil dual. Oh, it's 30 mil. 30 mil dual-barreled GSH, 30 mil gum. And this humble close air support aircraft could easily turn tides against an attacker. Um, before we go off guns, um, uh, there's a great video I'm looking to do in the SU-25 where we can have, I think, one, two, three, four. Ah, I think these might be gun pods, actually. Um, I haven't looked at this for a while. You can have one, two, three, four gun pods and the twin-mounted gun, totaling like 12 barrels or something of 23 and 30 mil. And they are depressible, so these guns actually come out and, and, and aim and move. Uh, it's just crazy good. Yeah, I saw this one and I was wondering if you can use that in the Thunderdome. It would be awesome. SC-25 prototypes demonstrated their capability of carrying four tons of payload during the Afghan campaign while operating from high altitude bases. Production of SU-25 would see extensive use in the theater. We've got one here with its kind of aft nacelle fuselage being completely blown away. It must be a heat seeker, I guess, to get that position. But, uh, I mean, that warhead just nailed everything, whatever that warhead was. And carried on flying, obviously. A similar one, must again, probably a heat seeker, man pad or whatever. Amazing the amount of damage that those warheads do. I mean, th all the metal is just destroyed. Engine is just flopped out, look, but it just carried on, which is um, pretty respectable, really. The guy's just standing on a tire. <laughs> that's, that's, that's impressive. Uh, another one, probably the same one, not sure. Uh, again, I mean, it's right off the cell, blown to pieces. And we've got a similar on the other side. Um, again, seems to be where they get hit here, just completely blown to pieces by man pad or whatever. So it's damage, uh, and managed to return, yep. Unlike the USAF, Russian Air Force is no way abandoning one of their most capable aircraft. Good on them. Several of the mothballed SU-25s are being upgraded to new standards. So over the years, I mean, I've been reading about this, lots of them have just been kept, like the Russians like to do, if they don't use something, they tend not to just break them up for uh, metal. Sometimes they do. But a lot of times they just buy big hangers and leave them sitting there. And then, you know, like 40 years later, they've suddenly realised they need them, so they upgrade them to MPUs or whatever version they want to upgrade them to. You can, they often convert them even to two-seaters. Uh, being upgraded to new standards with new weapons, targeted systems, self-defense suites, upgraded engines. SU-25 is also used as a carrier trainer by the Russian Navy, which is awesome. To train its budding pilots, the SU-25, like the A-10, is also combat proven, but it has operated in tougher conditions. They face Stinger man pads and anti-aircraft fire during the uh, Soviet-Afghan campaign and perform well during the conflict. SC-25 would surely serve the Russians and its foreign operators for years to come. If there is one thing the SC-25 SU can do that the A-10 can't is to operate from a carrier, here is the SU-25 UTG, which is just, like we said, a trainer for the uh, MiG-29s and SUs, Sukhois, fighters taking off from the Ad Admiral Kuznetsov, um, which is very impressive. Um, technically, in DCS, we can land A-10C if you use the gun to break by the end of it. Uh, the SU-25, my favourite version, um, and uh, the A-10. Great presentation there, uh, Ivan. That was all I could want, just the right amount of information and just the right amount of information. Like I said, I'm going to be uh, documenting this soon, and I'll also be redocumented this when the Thunderbolt 3, I know it's not the proper name, but you know what I mean, comes out in DCS. Anything you want to add to that presentation, Ivan, while well, I've got you on? Oh, just people are trying to compare them for the wrong reasons, and quite often they're like trying to put them against each other and it's a different philosophy and different aircraft but the same basic 
performance, I guess. Well said. Okay, uh, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that and see you later.